this uh, an epilogue for graduates. It's not long, so you don't have to stay awake for very long. My speech is not so very um, uh, long. But I must, uh, before I start, apologize to the great Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I have stolen from him, shamelessly, some inspiration and guidance. And also, um, I had in mind our dear and cherished Charter of the United Nations. So, dear students, distinguished guests, seven decades and seven years ago, our forefathers and mothers created the United Nations to save your generation and succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in one lifetime brought untold sorrow to humankind. They created the UN to sustain human rights and the sacred dignity of each and every individual on the planet. And while we are gathered in elegant, if not sunny upland meadows this morning, your new profession and our common humanity behoves that we look at this moment eastward where Ukraine is fighting for its life against an unprovoked, barbarous, and cruel invasion. A war that will test also whether a world of laws and peace can long endure. And a war that will test also whether the free world, it's now fashionable again, correct and accurate to call it that, can find the resolution the determination and the courage to resist barbarous, invasive tyranny. The invasion of Mr. Putin, who now wants to be Peter the Great, although Peter the Great met his Waterloo of all places in Ukraine in the year 1711, where on the 23rd of July he was forced to surrender, his forces having been ill-prepared so that he was humiliated and he met his end at the Battle of the River Pruth, which ironically rises and flows to the sea in Ukraine. At the moment, the invasion, as we all know, has brought to Ukraine rape, pillage, torture, murder, the forced deportation of children away from their families and into Russia. And we are met now in the very shadow of our neighbor, the United Nations. And indeed, the United Nations on the same grounds where the previous League of Nations existed. Two organizations that Churchill would have referred to as a great step forward in the hard march of man. But the truth is that the values we need to defend, the UN values, Often, the UN does not necessarily have the power or the means to resist tyranny as it should because the Security Council and other bodies are often blocked by the veto. So, I quite openly uh, express our support for the brave people of Ukraine. And I'm very proud of our students who flew and drove to the Ukraine-Poland border to welcome so many thousands of Ukrainian uh, refugees, some five million forced out of the country and some eight or nine million displaced within Ukraine. In other words, what's happening, the tragedy in the Ukraine, is of great consequence and import for the future of all of us. Back in the fifth century BC, a great and long and terrible war for 27 years took place between Sparta and Athens, one being the home of democracy, the other Sparta being totalitarian. Sadly, it was Sparta that won. In the modern Cold War, recently ended, it was the West led by the United States which won. So in a way the score is one all, 
and with a weakened international community, be sure that the, the playoffs or the defining struggle lies ahead of us. For that reason, the Ukraine, a tragedy in and of itself, where the people of the Ukraine, with a rich culture, a rich literature and language, have the right to be free and independent. But also, they stand now, the Ukraine, as the senior sentry at the gate, literally, between the free world and a world of tyranny. So it's of vital importance, A, because of our compassion to stand with how Ukrainians are suffering and help them, and B, because what is happening there is the bellwether for what will happen to us all in the future. We want and we welcome that a free and independent Ukraine be a member of the European family of nations. And let us all support them, please, so that a Ukraine of Ukrainians, governed by Ukrainians, for Ukrainians, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, the Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, and dear friends, on behalf of the municipal authorities of Pradishambezi, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Welcome to the Domaine de Pente in all your various capacities. Although small, our commune can be proud of the fact that it is home to a certain of number of diplomatic properties. With no less than 11 diplomatic missions, almost 60 ambassador residents, one international organization, the WHO, and of course, the GSD itself. This strong international presence here make us the Geneva Commune with the highest of proportion foreign of residents out of a total of 45 communes in Geneva. Almost 45% of the total of the population comes from other parts of the world. So in some ways, Prony Chambézy can be considered as the heart of international Geneva, even though it plays no part in diplomacy. The last time I gave a welcome address was for the graduation ceremony last year. In my words to those students, I highlighted the importance of the word diplomacy and its dictionary definition. That definition mentioned three strong terms that I would like to mention here. Negotiation, recognition among people, and resolving problem without violence. If we consider the present day geopolitical situation or the pandemic, we have just been through, you will admit that these terms are rich in meaning as we are able to apply them to our own immediate surrounding. Negotiation, the ability to discuss issues with the aim of finding of a consensus. Isn't that the best way to help our society move forward? Or more commonly, isn't this the perfect reflection of the institution that you are due to represent or manage in the future? Recognition among people. Isn't this the best way to undertake diplomatic discussion? By adopting an ethical attitude full of respect for the person sitting on the other side of the table. Our willingness to recognize someone is essentially a way of accepting the other person as he is, regardless 
of his origin or beliefs. Resolving problems without violence. In this day and age, we fully understand the importance and weight of the world without violence. During diplomatic negotiation, we realize how important it is to pass on knowledge, messages, and experience that will lead us into a better world for, a good, for the good of everyone. Thanks to the training you have received, you will be the one solving tomorrow's problems. I'm sure you have understood the true meaning of words is more important than ever in the world of today. No matter what negotiation you will be involved in, you will often need to find the right words to resolve a conflict. Without actually reading the dictionary to you, allow me to add one last word that is less academic than what I have said up to now. Friendship. This shared feeling of affection or affinity that is not based on family ties or beliefs, but merely on the sincere feeling of commitment to another person. To conclude, I would like to thank the GSD and its president for all these years of friendship with the commune. I'm certain that they will continue for, every, for a very long time to come. Incidentally, I have to admit that like true friends, whenever we meet, Colonel Murphy and I always prefer to talk about a drink. And that isn't going to change anytime soon. I wish everyone here a wonderful day in Prenichon Bézy and hope that the friendship that develops among you will remain a solid foundation for or even despite your future responsibilities. Merci pour votre attention et un très bon dimanche. Ambassador Dr. Wolfgang Eschinger, Honorable Monsieur le Maire de Prenichon Bézy, Honorable President of GSD, fellow faculty members, class of 2022, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, congratulations to you, Ambassador Dr. Wolfgang Eschinger, for this distinguished award provided by GSD in recognition of your outstanding diplomatic career. This is a very special day for you, class of 2022. The journey to the graduation day is never an easy one, but for you graduates, this was even tougher as half of your studies were overshadowed by the coronavirus pandemic and the conditions that were imposed on you. Getting here by, for, for you all required enormous fe flexibility and challenges. It required encouragement from your family members, guidance and support from the faculty, staff of GSD, who managed to keep classes going throughout the pandemic period. A big hand of applause to all those who helped to get you here. My statement this morning is addressing you graduates, the future diplomats, about the real diplomacy by dialogue, the art of diplomacy that we need in this troubled world, a concept that we have often discussed in classrooms together. We have noted how the art of diplomacy has changed since 11 September 2001, from dialogues and negotiation by diplomats to instructions and ultimatums by generals. If we look at the state of the world today, we know that this is not working. We need a different kind of honest, even-handed diplomacy by envoys with the right profile, with full plenipotentiary powers, who recognizes the importance of dealing with all parties 
to the conflict under the same protocol, working quietly as a preventive measure and publicly in shuttle diplomacy, adjusting negotiations and consultations along the way. Responding in ways that are truly culturally sensitive, avoiding derogatory word descriptive and, uh, and intellectual and cultural arrogance, and understanding the wide spectrum of political, historical, and regional perspective that shape our world. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on World Refugee Day 20 June, UNHCR announced 100 million forcibly displaced people as a result of war and persecution in the world today. They are, these are not refugee crises, but political crises that world leaders can resolve together by addressing their differences. UNHCR has enormous work ahead as world leaders remain unable or unwilling to resolve conflicts that would enable forcibly displaced people to return home in safety and dignity. The shrinking of the humanitarian space in the global south and the erosion in the asylum system in the developed countries continue also to be huge challenges to UNHCR and its partners. With the current scale and complexity of global force displacement, no single country or region can bear the burden alone. I'm delighted to see today representatives of some of the world's largest refugee hosting countries present here with us. Despite the call by the UN Secretary General for Global Ceasefire, the world remains at war. With most of the people fleeing from one of the multiple conflicts fought around the globe that contributed to the above 100 billion figure, the highest in our history. We have witnessed in recent years the lack of capacity in the international community to prevent and solve conflicts and to make peace. The war agenda is on the rise again, not only in Europe, but, but also in different parts of the world where we should not lose focus. In increasing complex conflicts where there are no longer any winners but only losers, the war industry is a big business supported by some countries at the expense of others. Diplomacy has to do more to stop these wars. We must learn from our history and not make the same mistakes. The absence of honest diplomacy has also contributed to keeping so many of these wars and protracted political situation unresolved. The gaps between the different regional and political perspectives have widened as all sides perceive the other negatively and, and lack the confidence and trust to start a real diplomatic dialogue. This has resulted in a world where interlocutors often prefer to work apart or within selected groups rather than collectively to address peace and security as called for in the charter of the UN 77 years ago. The importance of preserving peace and saving succeeding generations from the scourge of war should always remain the fundamental principle of the UN charter and its values as Colin has just said. You class of 2022 should never stop reminding yourself of the importance of the 77 years document and always defend its values. As you graduates noted in your studies in international relations, the UN is an organization that has limitation and can only work as a conveyor, a catalyst, and an honest broker to bring people together. But it is the moral duty of the 193 UN member states to strengthen the use of diplomatic option to prevent and resolve conflicts by settling their dispute through dialogue by using all the diplomatic weight and preventive skills in a theater of diplomacy rather than a theater of war. To achieve that, I believe there is a need for better political judgment, which based on the lessons of history and on the understanding of the importance of pre perception could introduce truly game-changing proposals for peace. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, wars cannot end wars and will never be a means of building peace. This is not the way to go. Article 51 of the UN Charter is rather clear about the use of force. In fact, UN Charter outlaws the resort to war and unauthorized use of unilateral forces by a member state. The war in Ukraine is a violation of that country's 
territorial integrity and the Charter of the United Nations. The international community got together in its quick response to this crisis with high standards and coherent and consistent actions. We must build on these positive examples and avoid double standards again in conflicts in other parts of the world. The UN Secretary General reiterated often that diplomacy remains the only tool that guarantees peace and stability with political solution to conflicts in accordance with the UN Charter. Instead of wars, we have to do more with our multilateral effort and with diplomatic dialogue to resolve conflicts, to ease geopolitical tension and enhance diplomacy for peace agenda. One based on readiness to engage those one doesn't agree with on empathy, on frankness, but also on respect, on discreet contact and quiet diplomacy. One of the lessons the past has taught us is that diplomacy takes time, but it shows the better results. As Angela Merkel said in her book launch earlier this month in Berlin, Europe and Russia are neighbors that could not ignore each other. We have to find ways to coexist, she said, despite all our differences, and having only war is not an option. And so in that sense, I guess I am advocating for real diplomacy by dialogue and for the agenda for peace rather than war, as I am speaking at the Geneva School of Diplomacy and not at Sandhurst or West Point. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this is a moment in time to celebrate you, the class of 2022, whatever career path you take, bilateral or multilateral diplomacy, always use the power of the real diplomacy by dialogue that you learned at GSD. Your own perspective on the today's crisis and on the response of the international community is important as you are the future generations of diplomats and many of today's problems will probably get passed on to you one day unresolved. GSD has provided you with, with a fine education and diplomatic tool. It is now up to you to seize the opportunities available to you. I hope you will succeed where our generation have failed. I feel privileged to have known you and appreciate our discussions together in the classrooms on world politics. I look forward to remain in contact with you through the social media on, on our alumni group and hope that we will have a chance to work together making this a better world. Congratulations to you, class of 2022. Well done. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Now it is my great pleasure and privilege to ask Dr. Professor Ambassador Wolfgang Issinger to join me here. Have you got the camera? <laughs> Hodie, we start in Latin. Hodie incomitus academicis admissum essay admitted this day into the academic community. Wolfgang Ischinger, for his outstanding diplomatic career, manifest at the highest levels with integrity, brilliance, and success. For his exceptional contribution to German and world diplomacy and democracy. For his fine contribution to a rules-based world protecting peace and human rights, for never losing sight of North on our common moral compass, and thus for his very real inspiration to future generations, is hereby conferred with and admitted to the university degree of Doctor of International Relations, DIOR, honoris causa in witness whereof, by the authority committed to us in law, we have hereunder placed our name as testimony, 26 June, 2022. Thank you. Thank you. What a great day. First and foremost, <clears throat>
before I turn to you, uh, my long time friend, Colm, let me congratulate the class of 22. This must be one of the greatest days you've had in your life so far. I congratulate you from my heart, uh, and I wish you the best going forward. Uh, I remember the year as a law student, the year I spent here in Geneva myself. Uh, it's actually longer ago than I uh, wish to uh, <laughs> talk about. It's been, been half a century. Uh, but the memories I have of my year in Geneva uh, are extraordinarily beautiful and important memories. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Colum. Uh, thank you, uh, Atar, my friend. Thank you and the staff uh, of the school for this uh, invitation and for conferring on me this important honor. I'm humbled by it. I'm truly humbled by it, and I want to thank you from my heart. Excellencies, students, ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear, dear guests, um, the art of diplomacy was mentioned by both previous speakers. And I want to, I've been thinking about what can I say or do in um, returning a little bit and in expressing a little bit my gratitude, my appreciation um, regarding this invitation and this event here today. So I want to tell you that the team, which I've now been directing for 14 years, the team of the Munich Security Conference, has just very recently published a book coffee table size, titled The Art of Diplomacy. It contains contributions from Americans, Europeans, Asians, uh, etc., etc. The only reason I didn't bring a couple of copies is that each copy weighs three and a half kilos. It's really a coffee table size book, and the, it, the idea was that once it is on your coffee table, no one will want to carry it away because it is so heavy. So what I want to say this morning here is that I have uh, given instructions for a few copies to be sent by special delivery to the school for the benefit of the students, but of course also hopefully for the benefit of those members of the faculty who might wish to benefit from the contributions uh, in this book. I do not wish to add much to what's already been said, and I agree with all of it, about the war in, in Ukraine. But I want to tell you, I want to tell the students that uh, I returned from a difficult visit to Kiev just two days ago. I spent several days in Kiev along with uh, a few friends of mine also, most of them former senior diplomats, um, we all happened to be members of the board of something called the YES Conference, Yalta European Strategy Conference, which has been an annual event originally uh, in Yalta on the Crimean Peninsula. Once that had been occupied by the Russians, the event was transferred to Kiev and we are now debating whether this September we can actually organize a conference in Kiev under conditions of war. So Alexander Kwasniewski, who is a former president of Poland, uh, Karl Bildt, who is a former prime minister of uh, Sweden, um, and Kersti Kaljulaid, who is a former president of Estonia, uh, and I traveled to Kiev to talk to the leaders of the country, the foreign minister, the defense minister, many, many parliamentarians. I have come back 
even more impressed than I was before I went with the determination and the sense of identity and purpose which uh, I've met in each and every single conversation with uh, everybody uh, in, in Ukraine. An enormous sense of determination and purpose. And my friends, dear students, that's what life is about. It's about purpose. Uh, it's about purpose. And I want to talk uh, as we uh, try to deal with this uh, momentous watershed moment in, in European and in international uh, 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 relations, I will talk a little bit about purpose. But before I do that, and I know I have very limited time, I want to make one thing clear which, which is important for anyone practicing the art of diplomacy. It is important to understand what you believe you are actually seeing or hearing. And many of us underestimate the difficulty of precisely understanding what we think somebody is telling us or, 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 or what the message is. So listening very carefully what the message is, is part of the art of diplomacy. And there is no better anecdote uh, because I was thinking about something which I could say which would sort of stick in your memory. There's no, no better anecdote than the one that I remember about Pope Benedict. This was the German Pope uh, who is still alive. And the story, and I cannot promise that this is a true story, but it is a, a good story. The story goes as, as, as follows. Pope Benedict, during his tenure as Pope, uh, visited his old hometown of Munich in Germany. And after having attended mass, et, et cetera, uh, he was told that his next stop would be the uh, city of Stuttgart, two hours away by car. So they put him into a BMW 12 cylinder, seven series automobile. And the idea was to, for him to be taken to Stuttgart. On the way to the Autobahn, the Pope leaned forward in the car and said to this young driver, young man, you may be aware that when I was still Archbishop here in Munich, I was driving my own car. In Rome, they don't let me drive a car anymore. And I don't think I will ever in my life have an opportunity to drive a 12-cylinder BMW 7 Series if you don't allow us to change seats right now. So the young driver said, well, your holiness, of course. And he, you know, stopped uh, on the, the next parking space and along the autobahn. And they changed seats. Pope behind the wheel, that young man hesitating what he should do, sitting in the back seat. Uh, Pope goes off, and after about 15 minutes, he's, he gets stopped by a radar control of the Bavarian state police. The policeman approaches the car, according to protocol, you know, from behind, and looks into the car, and looks again, and then he decides before he writes, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the protocol, uh, he decides to call his boss in Munich and says, Chief, we've just caught this guy who was speeding 35 kilometers too fast. Uh, but I think this may be a kind of a VIP situation. <laughs> the chief in Munich says, have you not listened in, police, in the police academy? Here in Bavaria, everybody is equal before the law. So I don't care who this is. If he was speeding, give him a ticket. Hangs up. Our young policeman looks into the car again and then he decides to call his boss once more and says, Chief, just, I don't want to make a mistake, but I'm really convinced that this is a very special VIP situation. So the chief says, but who the hell is the guy in the car? And the young policeman says, Chief, that's the problem. I don't know who he is. What I do know is his driver is the Pope. <laughs> So 
So, you know, uh, think of this story when you are in the future in the diplomatic profession or regardless in which profession you're going to be. It's very important to properly understand what you believe you see or, or, or what you hear with your own eyes. Interpret it correctly. And sometimes this is more difficult than we, than we tend uh, to think. You are now moving into the real world, you students. And I was thinking of something that John F. Kennedy said when he gave a commencement address in the 1960s. Uh, he said, and this is my uh, this is not, not, a, not a verbatim interpretation. He said, all our problems are actually man-made. And because they're man-made, they can also be solved by man, namely by you. And that's going to be your responsibility, whether it's war, whether it's climate, whether it's energy, whether it's hunger, food shortages, whether it's pandemics, WHO is only around the corner here, um, it's your responsibility. Don't ever think as you enter professional uh, uh, responsibilities, don't ever think that your only job is to do what your boss tells you. Challenge his or her thinking. We Germans have just had to learn that my colleague from the from the German mission will agree with me, we've just had to learn that many of the rather fundamental assumptions which we have held about our relationship with Russia, about uh, our, our commitment to peace, our uh, hesitation to spend more on defense, that many of these assumptions have been proven wrong. That the world is going, in, unfortunately, in a different direction and we need to react to that. In other words, keep challenging the assumptions. Don't just do what has always been done. Ask questions and think about the policemen along the Bavarian uh, Autobahn. As Chief Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, uh, said, um, and I think that is also a very important point to make, don't lose the faith. There will be moments in your life when you will be frustrated, when maybe the job that you want to have or the partner you want to marry uh, is not going to do exactly uh, as you like. Uh, don't give up. Don't give up uh, and keep pushing. Um, and Steve Jobs added, and, and this is really a good a good point to make, that life is rarely something that happens in a straight line. Maintain the freedom to make your life an adventure and always be true to yourself. Do not try, and this is something I really say personally, do not try to be somebody else. If you try to be somebody else, you will never, uh, you know, really meet your own personal goals. Role models are great to have, but don't try to imitate the role models. Use the role model as, as an inspiration, but be yourself. And stay open for unexpected turns of the road. As the famous American baseball player and philosopher Yogi Berra said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. But what that really means is uh, remain open for unexpected opportunities. Such an unexpected opportunity happened to me after have, having concluded law school and Harvard uh, Law School, etc. And out of the blue, the opportunity arose for me to work first as an intern, then as a young official at the United Nations. And it changed my entire future, my life. Uh, and if I had not been open, to this unexpected, different opportunity, I would not be here today. And certainly, my life would have gone in a very different direction. I want to add one final point on international diplomacy. International law, the way it has developed 
since the Treaty of Westphalia, Münster and Osnabrück in the you know, 1648, international law has fundamentally been developing and, and been developed further in the direction of maintaining the territorial integrity, the sovereignty, uh, the, also the security of the nation state. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's been a fundamental principle of life. But what we have seen happening in, over the last decades is that this, these principles, these sacred principles of international law, have actually been used to protect the dictators uh, who were actually doing very bad things to their own population. Just think of Bashir Assad in Syria. And I could give you many, many other examples. In other words, um, it was possible because Bashir Assad invited the Russians into his country it was possible for the Russian Air Force to operate in Syria. It was not possible, at least not under this interpretation of international law, for other countries to come into uh, Syria to help protect the civilian uh, population from being overcome, from being, from being attacked, from being killed. That is not a good situation. Uh, many of us have tried over the last decade or two to promote the idea of the re responsibility to protect. The idea that the nation state uh, has a responsibility to protect his own citizens. And in cases where this is not possible or is not happening, it, this responsibility is transferred to the international community. That's the idea, a, an idealistic idea which has not made much headway for reasons I have no time here to explain. But what I want to say and what I want to tell you, think about if you enter the business of international diplomacy in the future, think about how we can work in small steps to make sure that international law protects not only the dictators, but the human beings. How can we make sure that international law is a law that protects mankind, that protects men and women and children, not only against foreign attacks, but also about, against misdeeds of their own uh, leaders. And that has happened too many times. So think about how we can work in this spirit of making human security, not only the nation state's security, an important goal of our work as international diplomats. Thank you very much for your patience. Dr. Murphy, Ambassador Ischinger, Dean Sultan Khan, Mr. Schwarm, members of the faculty, family, friends, and fellow graduates, good morning. First, I'd like to inform Mr. Adnan that this speech has been uploaded to Turnitin and has met the necessary <laughs> academic requirements. <laughs> My fellow graduates, our graduation today is a tribute to the hard work, dedication, and sacrifices we all have made over the past years. I'm certain that the happiness from the room today stems both in our academic successes and the delight of working together to get here. In my years at GSD, I have learned that we don't have to seek far from inspiration and that we all have the power to inspire people by remaining true to our beliefs and pursuing great objectives. Dear graduates, celebrate how much you have accomplished, but also recognize how you too may inspire others. The Geneva School of Diplomacy has been more than simply a place where we have gained knowledge. It's also a place where we have formed lasting friendships and developed the required diplomatic skill. I believe I speak for many when I say that our interpersonal and leadership abilities were tested and honed in this environment. I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our professors 
who were a steady source of guidance, and to the faculty who ensured that our learning journey sailed as smooth as possible. Additionally, we are grateful for each of our personal support systems, whether family, friends, or both. These past years have had its fair share of ups and downs, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, we persevered with your unwavering support. As I stand here, I would like to thank my dear parents, without whom I would not be where I am today. Dear graduates, as you leave here today, be proud of your accomplishments. Congratulations to the class of 2022. Thank you. Dr. Murphy, Mr. Schwarm, Dean, Ambassador Ischinger, members of the faculty, family, friends, and most importantly, class of 2022. In the little time I have, I do not intend to make a political statement. I believe everything important has already been said. Today is about celebrating under Geneva's blue sky. Well, <laughs> it's too late to change the speech now. While preparing this very speech, I asked myself, how am I different today than I was 18 months ago? A few additional gray hairs, perhaps, uh, sure. <laughs> a few thousand pages of essay written, and a few million pages of reading on my shoulder, maybe? Sure, times two. Well, in the end, it's none of that. It is, but it's not. I'm different today because I feel like I'm more equipped to recognize the opportunities that are presented in front of me. And I'm so very glad that Ambassador Ischinger mentioned and underlined the word uh, opportunity. That's exactly what I want to talk about. To be more specific, the three kinds of opportunities that each one of us experienced in the past two years and ought to treasure from. First of all, the opportunity to be here. And for that, I want to thank the parents, the family, the loved ones for providing the possibility to be here, graduating from our world-class master program. Either financially or psychologically or even emotionally, they have all sacrificed something for providing us with this first, first kind of opportunity, which I firmly believe that we have all seized. Don't get me wrong, some of the loved ones did it for selfish reasons. Do not try to convince me that there isn't a single parent here that wanted some peace at home by sending his child to Geneva. Mom? Dad? Maybe. I'm joking. We should all recognize that we stand upon the shoulder of giants, and it, it's thanks to the previous generation if we're able to accomplish anything today, including having the possibility to, st to study at this very level. I want to thank the school, but most importantly, the outstanding faculty for providing the second kind of opportunity. That is the chance to master something. GSD may not be the largest school, it may not have the most facility, it may not have 100 classrooms, but what it does have it is a unique faculty composed by accomplished professionals that on top of teaching, they rely on decades of experience in their respective fields and in the, in the world of international relations. They have mastered something, not us, despite today's diploma. We may not have realized it every day, but the opportunity they provided us is in the tools and the skills that sooner or later will help us master our respective fields. They gave us the potential to change the world. It is our duty to use it wisely. I do not say that lightly or as a cliche. Each and every one of us, partly thanks to these brilliant minds, today has the power to change something. That is precisely the third kind of opportunity I want to be thankful for today. It is the opportunity that we have yet to seize. It is the opportunity that we will have to restlessly chase from now on. Thanks to our effort and the support of those around us, we are now ready to make an impact in this world. Even if this is the kind of opportunity that we will never reach because there will be always something more to achieve, something more to change, something more. I am already grateful for it. Why? Because I know now that, like the rest of us, I am more equipped with the skills and the mindset to do my part in the world of international relations. I can only conclude by saying to you what I believe this school and this program taught us. Go be great, go change the world. Congratulations, class of 2022. The Honorable President of the Geneva School of Diplomacy, Dr. Colin Murphy. The Dean of the Geneva School of Diplomacy, Dr. Arthur Sultan Khan. His Excellency Ambassador, Professor Wolfgang Ischinger. The Honorable Mayor of Chambesi, Mr. Philip Schwarm. Dear Administrators, Faculty Members, Parents, friends, and so my dear fellow graduates, good morning to all of you. The past months have certainly been challenging for all of us, but now 
I stand here in front of you all to share with you the fruits of my labor and the blessings bestowed on me by God, which have brought me closer to my lifelong dream of being in the diplomatic arena. When I received the news that I had been admitted to the GSD to pursue a master's program with a fellowship, I was pleasantly surprised, but at the same time, things were making me anxious. First on the list was the huge amount of money that my parents may have to spend on my education and leaving expenses in Switzerland. I was torn for months confronted by these two options at that time, namely to study in China with a 100% scholarship or to study here in Switzerland with expenses to be shouldered by my parents. But I knew deep in my heart that I will go to a university that will allow me to come close to my dream job, to work in the United Nations as a diplomat. Long story short, I fought for and chose to be here. Over the course of my stay here at GSD, I became a student ambassador, an academic assistant, and an intern at the same time. Juggling three roles was never easy, but despite the stress and the occasional procrastination, persisting in pursuing my studies took a lot of patience. Studying the various courses late into the evening or waking up as early as possible to prepare myself for my lessons and examinations in class. Hence, these challenges honed me like a sword, ready to thrust itself into the long and arduous battle called by many as, as, of the, as the real world. Throughout my stay, various heading events have happened that have tested our knowledge, skills, and altruism through engaging in humanitarian work, particularly when the war in Ukraine started. With the full cooperation and support of my classmates, we raised enough money to buy essential goods for the Ukrainian refugees, mainly women and children, who fled to Geneva. The work didn't end, end there as it continues through the initiative of GSD and in coordination with the Polish Humanitarian Action, where we students volunteered to go to Poland and serve almost 15,000 Ukrainian refugees crossing the Polish-Ukrainian border. The donations that we have received were used to buy more essential goods needed and worked an eight-hour shift at the border serving refugees 24-7. These things have taught me kindness and its power to touch and save people's lives. In the course of building my career, I have had all of you, my wonderful professors, to whom I will be eternally grateful for the chance you have given me to get more knowledge and be better prepared to further advance once I complete my dissertation and internship. I also have the good fortune of being taught by good mentors, especially Ambassador Rosario G. Manalo, my former professor in my bachelor's degree, who has trained me in the real life setting of the diplomatic field. All of these happenings up to this point of our graduation have motivated and convinced me to pursue the diplomatic profession. I realize that this dream I have will not be easy, but faith, determination, persistence, integrity, and respect for all the peoples of the world will bring my dream into reality. So, my dear fellow graduates, as we start the new journey of our careers, I want you to realize that everything good is possible in this world, but nothing worth, worth having comes easy. That all of you may have equal, if not better opportunities than myself to advance in your dreams by achieving a succeeding in the profession of your choice through the education that we have all obtained from our alma mater, the Geneva School of Diplomacy, and the good people who have guided, helped, and taught us. Let us continue to work hard, and may we never stop doing things that matter well for all the people in the world. In the end, let me share with all of you one of the best quotes from one of my heroines, Her Royal Highness, Princess Grace Kelly of Monaco. 
I was hired to be an actress, not a personality for the press. In diplomacy, I too wouldn't want to be known for being just a diplomat who got attention and as, a, as someone who hogs the spotlight. I hope that all of us here, wherever life takes us in the next few years, would become known for causes greater and more powerful than any human force, any known weapon, or any diplomatic channel. I hope that in the end, we will all be forces for good with eyes on the goal and feet on the ground. Congratulations to all of us and may all of you succeed in your dreams. Thank you and a blessed good morning. First is Calvin Andrade from the BA. Calvin. Hiral Ramesh Hirani. The master's program, um, Kude Chatu Diallo. <laughs> Eliza Grace Dominguez. <laughs> Cassandra Maria Fiore. <laughs> Lutfi Gijura. <laughs> Nitant Giant. And Arzu Kutuchu Ozenen. And Juan Francisco Martinez Fernandez. Nicole Marchetti. Emanuela Mistreta. And Chao Yang Kuan. Roman Grutan. Umberto Amadeo Setter. <laughs> Sidika Tasnim Singh. <laughs> Francesco Steinhauslin. <laughs> Ethan Christopher Stiles. Cedrin May Fettingel. <laughs> and Ioannis Zaferiu. <laughs> From the Executive Master's Program, Alan Azi Maha. And Catherine Kunap Moser. Thank you very much, Dean. Please. Uh, now I ask all the graduates to stand. This is the part where it's very scientific. Um, 
This is the findings of the latest scientific studies from the right side of your brain, which is considered to be dead, but less now that you've graduated, to the left, the heart side, where you take this very much to heart. So when I say three, move your tassel to the left side. So now you have to put it back again. Ready? One, two, three. where I make my closing remarks. Frankly, I think you've heard enough of me, so I will keep my closing remarks to 37.4 seconds. I've said enough about our main theme today, um, Ukraine. I think I have made my view very clear, and we all aspire to uh, what our Dean said. There are times, however, I believe, when certain dictators need, in addition to diplomacy, a very hard punch. But in any case, what do I know? It'll be for you people, as we get older, to um, deal with these dilemmas. You will need professional skills. You're not going to hire a plumber who doesn't know about plumbing or hire somebody to fix your television unless they know something about electricity and televisions. You have that in international relations, international law, international economics. But if you ever lose sight of compassion, forget it. Always make certain that that is central and a guide to your technological expertise. And do remember the other word, that your mission in life while building a happy, prestigious, satisfying and good career, your mission is to lower the level of cruelty in the world. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.